Um, uh, yesterday I was praying into today, and then we hit the prayer this morning at 9.30. Um, and I think everyone in here was in the prayer at 9.30. And there was a, a real sense of something that I want to kind of try and preach and try and get th- out from my heart into your heart. There's a real, there was a real sense and a shout of praise, a real sense of victory. But the image that I got when I was, um, and I, I'm not wanting to pictures and visions and, and all that kind of stuff, unless, unless obviously, you know, God's free to do that, but I'm not going to chase after that. But the image I got in my mind, in my mind's eye, in my imagination, was that some people, they understand the authority of the believer. They know that, you know, they've read the books. They, Brother Hagen wrote a great book, and that book was pretty much attributed to a lot of the uh, communism in Russia and, and all that kind of collapsing, the wall of Berlin is collapsing because the believers found out that their authority and they started using it. Um, and a lot of people have this image of, I've got the authority that God's given me. I can speak to the devil and I can tell him off and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of people are thinking in their heads, all I have to do is speak. I have to speak, 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 speak. I've got to speak the word. But in their minds, they're about the height of this pulpit. They're about two foot tall. And they're staring at this devil or problem or circumstance or situation that's like the rock. Not the rock of Jesus, the rock of the wrestler, if you know who that is. So Elston is probably smaller than the rock. Is a massive guy. And we're sitting here with our authority and understanding and we want to shout him down. We want to take authority over this big, massive problem, big, massive circumstances, but we're down here. We're sitting in this place as a tiny little human being trying to get something to move. It's almost like what Jesus says in Mark 11, 22 and 23, speak to the mountain. But you go up to the mountain and you just look at the mountain and you just think, I'm speaking to it and nothing's shifting. And this big bad devil, he's not, you know, most of us are mature enough to know that he hasn't got little two little horns and a red cape and a little spike. In fact, if we saw him like that, we'd probably have a little bit more power in our lives because we'd realize how foolish it is. But most of us are looking at this situation and circumstance and going, that's a bit bigger than I thought it was. And the reality is, is we understand the principle of the authority of the believer, but we're not correctly walking it out. We're not seeing things that we say change. Mark 11, 22 and 23 says, you'll have what you say if you believe it in your heart and you speak it out of your mouth that you don't have any doubt in your heart, but you will have what you say. But the reality is that we're trying to do something that hasn't quite worked or hasn't quite clicked. If we go to Ephesians chapter 1, I want to read some scripture verses and talk a little bit into this because I believe this is something that has dropped in my heart that while we're in worship, I have got notes for today and I, I might get to them, but I want to start here. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17. In fact, while you're turning there, I'm going to read a scripture verse. Because this is where most people think of where we are when we're in authority. Jesus was spoken of in Philippians 2, verse 7, that he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Listen to this, verse 9. Wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, most people have no problem saying, I speak the name of Jesus. Most people have no problem recognizing where Jesus is. 
Most people have no problem understanding that he died, went to hell, and was raised from the dead and placed highly exalted above every other name. But if we go to Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul, who is called the Pauline Revelation, and it's a revelation that the apostles of the Lamb, Peter, James, and John, struggled with. They didn't understand everything about it. Peter said, in fact, that it was difficult to understand, but it was still breathed of the Holy Spirit. So First Peter talks about the, these things that are difficult to understand, but we need to run with them. See, the Apostle Paul didn't just come up with some divine revelation, which many people do. Many people come up with these revelations and they, they want to preach them and share them online and Facebook and, and YouTube and all this kind of different stuff. They just want to share the latest word of, of whatever. But the Apostle Paul actually submitted what God had showed him to the apostles in Jerusalem. He went, he went away for 15 years and then came back into Jerusalem and talked to them about it and discussed it. I think there were some arguments and all sorts of fun stuff that went on with the Apostle Paul and, and the, uh, the apostles. But they recognized the call of God on his life, and they recognized that he had something deposited to him. I think it says in Corinthians, when he talks about the thorn in the flesh, he actually talks about him going up into heaven. And most biblical scholars would say that the Apostle Paul's talking about himself at that moment. He actually says, a man that went up into the third heaven or whatever. I'm not, I'm not quoting it accurately, but it says it in first, I think it's first four, chapter 14 in first Christian. Let me just flip there. I don't like to quote things without thinking about it. And my sermon isn't about Paul's thorn in the flesh, don't worry, because that'll throw a lot more fun into the, into the game. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, it says this, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of body I cannot tell, God knows, such as one caught up into the third heaven. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows, knows he, how that he was caught up into paribus and heard, listen to this, unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. And he talks about his, his, um, the issue that he had with the, 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 the Paul thorn in the flesh, quote-unquote. And he says it in here, Lest I be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. So God had been working in the Apostle Paul for many years, just giving him information, giving him revelation. So if we go to Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul prayed some prayers for the church of Jesus Christ. In verse 17, and, and of course, there's another prayer in Ephesians. There's a prayer in Philippians and a prayer in Colossians. These prayers are some of the best prayers to pray. Now, if you've never prayed a spirit-filled prayer or a spirit-led prayer and you don't know how to pray properly, the best place to start is in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is a letter written to the church bringing a revelation of something that the church of Jesus Christ must have in these last days. It's probably one of the most important books in the New Testament. The other, uh, like uh, Colossians and Philippians, they, they kind of draw a lot from Ephesians. I, can't, I, I don't know enough about biblical history to know which one was written first. It's probably easy enough to look if you have a modern Bible. It usually tells you the beginning of my, my, this, my King James doesn't tell me when it was written. But verse 17 or verse 16, he says this. And of course, this is a prayer that I've grown up in in the background of my Bible school, the ministers that talk about the, these prayers all the time. And in fact, the, the minister that kind of um, is overseen, was overseeing the Bible schools that I graduated from used to pray this prayer thousands of times. And he says he started praying it many years ago, probably in the 19. 40s area time, maybe even earlier, maybe a little bit later. And he started praying these prayers daily, thousands of times. And eventually what happened was he started to speak and he realized that when he was preaching, all of a sudden he was going, what was I preaching before? It must have been complete junk <laughs> in his eyes. Because if we listen to what it says here, let's, and this is what the Apostle Paul said. This is my long-winded introduction. 
Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention you in my prayers. Now, if we believe that the Bible is God breathed, the Holy Ghost breathed into every scripture verse, if we believe that, then we can take these scripture verses and these prayers, if Paul prayed them for somebody else, we can pray them for somebody else and we can also pray them for ourselves. A good parent will pray this over their kids. Uh, a good pastor will pray this over their church. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. The Apostle Paul is praying for these people in Ephesians. We can take it on for ourselves, and I often put my name in this, that the God of my Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto me the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of my understanding are enlightened, that I may know what is the hope of his calling what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards me who believes. I'm a believer. Some of us need to say that a bit more. I'm a believer. According to the work of power. Now, this is where it goes into Colossians territory, or sorry, Philippians territories, and it says, and set him at his own right hand, in verse 20, in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might, and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is to come, and has put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Wonderful. Jesus has won the battle. He's set down in heavenly places. In fact, you could actually put some brackets in the mid verse 20 and the end of verse 23. That is almost a side thought. If you skip to verse 2, which he had wrought in Christ in verse 20 when he raised him from the dead, and you, it says in verse 1, who were dead in trespasses and sins. He wrought, he, he, he put something in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead, and you who are dead in trespasses and sins. The subjects changes to you and me. Where in times past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation or lifestyle in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You. It's locating you. Where are you located? Are you still dead in trespasses and sins? Are you still dead in trespasses and sins? It's a, not a rhetorical question. You can answer. Are you still dead in trespasses and sins? No. There's a scripture verse in verse 4. With a three-letter word. This is one of my favorite little three-little words in the Bible. It says, but... So you were dead in trespasses and sins, but God. You were dead in trespasses and sins, but God, who is rich in mercy for his love wherewith he loves us, even when you were dead in sins, has made you alive together with Christ. I might be saying some things that you've already heard before, but I think it needs to be driven back into our hearts. And I know I'm not preaching the same way I, I normally preach, and this is very teaching. But I'm going to keep going because I believe there's a, the anointing and the Spirit of God is leading us this way. So hook up and pull. When we were dead in sins, he has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. See, everyone loves all this. Jesus is raised up. We're, we're no longer dead in our sins. We're alive. But verse 6 kind of hits people 
and people don't have a clue what's going on. And he has raised us up together and has made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If you think back to the, the, what I was talking about, about being this tall, two foot tall, looking at the problems and the circumstances that is bigger than you, that is massive, got muscle on it, it's developed, and you are a weedy little Christian who knows that they've got authority. They know they've got, they can take authority. But you're seeing this big monster in front of you, this big mountain in front of you. You are not locating yourself correctly as to where, how to deal with that pro problem. You cannot deal with your problem or the circumstances that you are faced with by looking at it. Because every time you look at a situation and circumstance, in the natural, you bring yourself into the place of trying to fight it, even though you are trying to speak the word of God, and even though you have a revelation of the authority that you've been given. You must understand that when Jesus was raised up from the dead, when he was raised up and placed into heavenly places, he did not do it alone. He took you with him. He took you with him into hell. He took you with him into the darkest and deepest place because he was paying the price for everything that we have done wrong. Every bit of sin, every bit of burden, every bit of sickness and disease, he took that on him. Poverty, he became poor so that we might become rich. But Jesus, when if you don't see yourself, and many people see themselves of going to hell in him, and many people see that Jesus was raised from the dead, and many people call Jesus Lord, but they don't see themselves as having moved past the resurrection point of the earth's atmosphere. They're still dealing with the, uh, the principalities and the powers of the air. They're still walking through the towns of cities of Preston's feeling the oppression, feeling the defeat, feeling the, the, oh my gosh, the devil's here, or oh my gosh, there's a stronghold here, oh my gosh, and all that, because they are locating themselves based on their natural position and not their spiritual position, and their spiritual position is seated in heavenly places beside Jesus Christ. When you understand the position that you stand in, you no longer see the problem that's in front of you because there is no problem in front of you. Do you think Jesus is sat beside the Heavenly Father and going, oh dear, Mount Everest, it's a really big mountain. I don't know if I can get above it. He's looking down at it. He's in fact on another planet if you believe heaven's a planet. Heaven's got a north, a south, and east, and a west, so it's, we, we believe it's a, somewhere in the earth, um, somewhere in the universe. But he is not dealing with our problems and our situations and circumstances from a position of, I'm going to come alongside you, and I'm going to be your buddy. You know when you have friends and you have drinking buddies or you go out and go bowling and you all talk about the problem and you all open up and say, oh, my wife's this, my wife's that, my husband's this, my husband. And you all have a good laugh and have a chat, but nothing gets changed, does it? You can have your best friend, girlfriend, go out for drinks, whatever, go out for cake, cup of coffee, cup of tea, chat about how wonderful your kids are or how horrible your kids are, but it doesn't change anything. But you see, if you see Jesus as coming down from heaven and sitting beside you and just having a chat about everything, and he becomes your buddy, there was a film called, there was a, a, a wonderful film, a horrible film really, but it was a film and they all had this, this image of buddy Jesus. They had this like statue of Jesus being your best friend. And I'm, I'm not saying he isn't our friend because we sang it this morning. Jesus is our friend. He's not your enemy. But he's not a coffee buddy. And he's not a drinking buddy. He's not a bowling buddy. 
He is somebody who's actually dealt with the problems that you are facing. In fact, he has gone through it all for us, and he knows and understands the feelings, the temptations, and the problems that you are facing now. He's our great intercessor. He's our high priest. Now, you can have him as a friend and a buddy. I remember John Bevere once telling the story of being a youth pastor, and one of the, the youth came up to him and said, can I be your friend? And he said, yeah, we can be friends. I can look after you. We can be buddy-buddy. We can go out and have some pizza together. But I won't be able to help you, spiritually speaking, because we'll be friends. Do you want me to be your pastor and to speak into your life so that you grow up and succeed in life, or do you just want to be friends? And, of course, the child had a revelation and realized that he wanted a pastor, not a friend. That's why some, some pastors, actually, some people go as, as far in ministry that you can't be friends with your congregation. And I think sometimes that you can, you can push that a bit too far and you can, and you whatever. But, you know, the, the, the reality is we need to understand when someone's speaking in the anointing and under the anointing that the, the, the importance is that your life has changed and if you pull on that anointing and that gift. If you see me in the natural and I see you in the natural and we see, look after each other after the flesh, if you call it, we don't get to see the the growth and the increase and the impact that God's got for each and every one of our lives. It's difficult with parents when parents see their children rise up. You know, I think uh, another minister was saying that he didn't realize that when his child got, his son got 14, 15, 16, he was still trying to parent him. And I understand the desire of the parent to parent your child. But if, if you don't switch your relationship to seeing them as brother and sister in Christ, they will, the, the spiritual impact that you can have into your child's life starts to limit and wane. Jesus died on a cross, was buried for three days, three nights, raised from the dead, he was raised from the dead by the Holy Ghost who created heaven and earth, who was there at the very beginning of time and will be there at the end of time. But that same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, the same spirit that went into hell and picked him up and resurrected him and poured life back from him. And if you, don't, if you don't understand this, and I can say something that's really, really controversial in many Christian circles, but if Jesus didn't die spiritually and go to hell for us, he would not have been able to be born again so that we could be born again. It says in Hebrews that Jesus said, God said to Jesus, I will call you again a son. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the spiritual, make, you know, him dying spiritually and being born again opened up the door. for. And people say, well, how could Jesus die spiritually? Well, you know, there was somebody else who died spiritually. Do you remember the first Adam? He was filled with the fullness of God, filled with everything. He was filled with life. And he sinned and rebelled. And when sin came in and entered, he died spiritually. He didn't die physically, did he? Adam lived for another 900 years, or 800 years, whatever. How old, I don't know how old he was when he spiritually died. And he regretted every moment of it. But if one instance of rebellion to God made him allow, uh, enabled Adam to be spiritually dead, then Jesus himself, when he said, willingly, I take the curse on me, the curse of sin, the curse of death, the curse of poverty, I take it on me, that enabled him to be turned into a spiritually dead being so that he could enter into hell. But an eternal being who's taken that on board of his life going into hell could pay the price for all of humanity because Jesus said the scales were balanced with him being in there three days and three nights. God could have said it needed to be six months, but it wasn't. It was only three days and three nights. It, it, it satisfied the scales of justice so that when he was raised from the dead, he could be placed and seated in heavenly places. But we, we're going, yeah, but you're talking about Jesus. You're talking about Jesus. That's Jesus. That's not me. That's not my life. 
And you have been raised up together and made to sit together in heavenly places. If Jesus went through it, paid the price for you and I, all you have to do is hop over to the book of Colossians And remember when I was talking about revelations, the Apostle Paul getting revelations, he says in verse 25 of 1, I'm a minister according to dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. You see, if the devil knew what he was doing in the cross, he wouldn't have ever crucified Jesus. Because in the Old Testament, the Bible says, cursed is he who hangs on a tree. So Jesus was cursed because he hung on a cross. Every person that hung on a tree would have been cursed, but he was eternal. He was the eternal son of God, birthed from a virgin Mary. Yes, filled with the word of God, filled with the glory of God, because God was the father. He was cursed on that cross and was able to take all of sin Sickness, disease, poverty, lack. I'm, I'm reiterating this time and time again because if you understand the, what Jesus paid the price for, you will have an understanding of what you are free from. When Jesus died on that cross and became, if the, if the devil had understood, he could have just left Jesus alone on, on this earth for 45 years, 50 years or whatever till his natural body eventually died. He would have been setting people free wherever he went, but he would never have reproduced himself. He could have taught his disciples, but they were not born again. They weren't filled with the Holy Ghost. He could have just lived out and the devil could have left it and that's done. Oh, well, Jesus' mission was failed. But the devil was so stupid in not understanding because he didn't have the revelation that the Apostle Paul is praying that me and you have. The revelation that is the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, this mystery among the Gentiles, which is what? Christ in you, the hope of glory. So your hope, your victory, your absolute expectancy, that word hope is the word absolute expectancy of the glory. What's the glory? We've sung about it. Goodness and mercy following me all the days of my life. Suddenly, you might be that tall in the natural you might be tiny. And no matter how big the devil is, how big he looks like that in the natural, you suddenly realize, well, hang on. I'm not stood here. I'm stood up there. I'm seated together with him in heavenly places. And in me is an anointing, then an expectancy of God's glory, of his goodness, of his ability, of the authority, of the, the, the opportunity for you to succeed in complete victory everywhere you go. But if you look at the big guy, the big strong guy, the mountain before you, and you even try and use the name of Jesus. You try and use your authority. It will not work if you do not understand where you are. Why did Jesus say it in Mark chapter 11? And it always is going to come back to, to this scripture verse. When Jesus said and answers to them, have faith in God, Mark chapter 11, 22, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. I tell you, it's a lot easier to believe God in what you're saying when you understand where you're sitting. Because th this, is, this is a true statement. This is spiritual principles. You will have whatsoever you say, but most people are having what they say because they're looking at the mountain and they're just saying the mountain. Even if they try and move the mountain with their mouths and try and believe, there's no uh, assurance on the inside of them. 
See, faith is a lifestyle. Faith is something we live by. Faith is something that we consume the Word of God and put that Word on the inside of us so that we can speak it in faith, so that we can have what we say. But if we don't understand who we are and where we belong and where we sit, we're going to struggle to see any real change in our lives. And people might, you might say to me, but, Andy, I'm, I've meditated on these scripture verses. It's just not working. I, I've thought about it. I've believed it. I've listened to all the faith tapes in the world. I've listened to all the tapes of authority. I've listened to all the everything. I've, do, I've done it all. I've done everything in my own strength to do. Oh, what? Now, let's go to my notes. Isaiah chapter 40. God's been dealing with me for something over the last, probably, last couple of years, just becoming, standing into this position of pastor and, and kind of learning how to, to flow in that and accurately and be the person that I need to be and be, have the character that I need to be. This is a long chapter, and I, I don't, I'm going to kind of skim our way through it, but there's some really important things because I, 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 most of your brain will probably go, oh, let's just turn to verse 28. Well, no, let's not. Let's start in verse 1. If you know Isaiah chapter 40, it has a, an amazing conclusion, but I don't want to get there yet. Because if you don't know who you are, who you serve, you're going to struggle in most things in life. And God's dealing with me about this. This is, this, you know, for my own personal life, personal ministry, and all that kind of stuff. We need to know these things because the assignment and the, the, the direction that this church is going and the direction that your life is going, it is essential that the foundation is stronger than anything ever before. I believe that Christians in these last days need to have a foundation stronger than sometimes many Christians in the past would have had to have. Though the times of the Middle Ages and the Romans and all that was horrible, we are faced different problems because we are faced not only with people who perhaps don't like us, but there's a bombardment through every means possible to try. See, the devil doesn't have to kill you to get you off track. He just has to get you watching Netflix every day. Too much TV. Too much entertainment. Getting obsessed about a football team. And these things aren't necessarily bad. I look, there's, a, there's a TV show we've been watching a very historical TV show about World War II and bombers and stuff like that. And it's, very, it's, it's quite enlightening on what they went through. It's fictional, but it's, it's very historic at the same time. There's nothing wrong with watching TV. But if you know every single stat of every football player on your team, if you know exactly how many goals they scored for the last 10 years, your mind is probably filled. And there are, there are people like this in ministry that you, the first thing you bump into them, they'll start talking to you about football. You think... Okay. I mean, I don't know much about football. I've never really been interested in, in football. I do support a football team. And I have been to see them in their stadium. And I've actually been and done the tour of their stadium. But that doesn't mean I don't know anything about them, really. I just know the color, you know, the red. You know, they've got red shirts. That's about all I know. I, I, I sometimes know who the main striker is because of, of the news. But I'm not... Yes, it is Liverpool, not Man United. We don't utter the words Man United in this church. Uh, we, we are, you know, Jack's not here. He's decided to try and become an Everton fan, but we are interceding and praying for him daily on that one. Isaiah chapter 40, let's, let's not get off track. You, you've got me thinking in the natural there. I don't know how I'm going to finish this by 12 o'clock, but we'll do our best. Isaiah chapter 40, comfort you, comfort you, my people, says God. Verse 3, the voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for your God. Every valley will be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, 
and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Verse 6, the voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodness, goodliness therein is of the flower of the field. The grass withereth, but the flower fades, because the Spirit of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Go to verse 18. To whom then will we liken God? Or what likeness will we compare him unto? The workman melts a graven image and, a, and the goldsmith spreads it over with gold and casts silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he has no oblation chooses a tree that will not rot. That's too much King James for me. He seeks unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that we shall not be moved. Mankind will always try and create an image of God. Verse 21, have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? Is he that sits upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are grasshoppers that stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in? He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of earth as vanity. Yes, they shall not be planted. Yes, they shall not be sown. Yes, the, their stock shall not take root in the earth. And he shall blow upon them and they shall wither and the whirlwind shall make them blow them away as stubble. To whom then will we liken me or shall I be equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and behold who has created these things that brings out their host by name. He calls them all by names by the greatness of his might. For he that is strong powers not fails. Why sayest you, O Jacob, and speak so, Israel? My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Why do you say these things, that God doesn't know what you're going through? Have you not heard? Have you not seen? Have you not, has it not been told from you from the beginning? Lift up your eyes. Behold, who has created these things? This year is a year of what? Lift. Lift up your eyes. And then it hits verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the heavens and earth, faints not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. And we go, yes, God's great. Jesus is great. But then it hits verse 29, it says, He gives power to the faint, and to him that has no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and shall not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Knowing that you're sat up in heavenly places is good. Knowing your authority is good. Knowing who you are in Christ is good. But if you don't do verse 31, your strength will fail you. The power will crumble and your revelation in your eyes will no longer lift up, but they will grow weary and look down and see the largeness of your enemy. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. There is a flow that the Spirit of God would have in your life that comes through waiting on Him. There is something about waiting on the Spirit of God. This isn't me waiting to see if Robert will turn up to a cup of coffee that we booked. And he's running 20 minutes late and I'm just waiting for him. That's not the kind of waiting we're talking about. Waiting upon the Lord, you are already in his presence. You know how easy it is to get into his presence? You can go two ways. You can go, hey God, I love you. You're there. Or you can go, Help, God. I need help. He's there. He said he'd never leave you nor forsake you. He's never going to abandon you. So you're always in his presence. If you're raised up in heavenly places, you're actually living in a place 
that is paved with gold, gates that are made out of pearl, a pearl. You are living in a place of prosperity. I said this once in the church, and I said this, I'm never going to be any more rich than I am right now. And everyone went, huh? Well, you're looking at what, what I'm wearing. You're looking at the car I drive. You're looking at my house. You're looking at whatever. But the thing is, I am a seed of Abraham. I am an heir of eternity. You know, if you understand that you are never going to die, that, that rock guy, that big rock guy that you're just looking up scared of and kind of trying to figure out how to get around him and, or run away from him so he doesn't beat you up, if you understood that even if the devil kills you with cancer, kills you with death and destruction, even if, he, if you understand that if I walk across the road to get hit by a bus tomorrow, I'm not going to die. It is impossible for me to die. You see, we were on the streets on Friday with Christ for All Nations. Um, I, I went out for just to watch how they did it, really, because we want to do it, go out on the streets and... Um, they don't do it much different than what we're planning to do, to be honest. And we went into Piccadilly Square in, in Manchester. And gosh, we need to go to Piccadilly Square in Manchester. Preston's easy. <laughs> um, because li literally the, the, the Muslims were setting their table up with their speaker system, and they had their singing, and it, it's not quite as nice as uh, I speak the name of Jesus. We had our music going. We had... Muslim lads just staring us down, and we had we were preaching. I mean, the, one of the lady I can't remember her name now. Um, I think it's Victoria. She was just preaching the gospel. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for the gays. Jesus died for the Muslims. Jesus died, and I'm like, whoa. I don't know if I've got the courage to say that online. Uh, but he was, she was doing it out in the streets just by herself, and all these these girls were walking past with their their headgear on, just shouting the name of Allah back. There was, um, I'm sure I got propositioned by a lady um, who had a pimp. I was just walking around. I got called a police officer because I was just walking around and praying in the Holy Ghost. Some guy came up to me. One guy, he had a sleeping bag over his head, and he just came up. He was just staring me down, and like, properly, and then eventually signed. There's another guy on a bench, obviously very drug-orientated, just like, you know, you know when you get evilly stared at? And I was just like, Jesus, what, what do I do? <laughs> I was only there for an hour, and these, these guys, I mean, I said to the Amanda who, who oversees Christ for All Nations, and I said to her, I said, gosh, I wasn't prayed up. <laughs> these guys were all prayed up, going, chasing them, and they were all preaching on the streets, and, and I thought, oh, God, I wish I, I was a bit more prepared for uh, prepared myself. I got a chance to pray for somebody, which is nice, and, you know, and, and they just lay hands on someone. There were people praying for people to be to be healed of, of pain and stuff. They were talking to people who had obviously been hurt by church. But, you know, we're sitting there in Piccadilly Square and you just look around and you just think, I could see the Christians because they're all wearing high-vis vests. But everyone else looked just messed up. If you go and sometimes it, in evangelistic terms, it, sometimes it's best to just go sit in the middle of a city, open your eyes and just cry. Because you see what the world is like. So, much, so often we go in, into our shopping and fill up our Morrison bags, Asda bags, Aldi bags, and don't say beer to a goose. And we walk around and, and we just don't even, aren't even aware. But sometimes it, it catches me off guard sometimes. I see something out of the, out of, out of the corner of my eye, some woman shouting at her child or some, some obviously alcoholic person just walking around. And I, my heart just, just bleeds. Have you not known? Have you not heard? You see, it says in Romans that they can't hear and they can't know if someone doesn't go tell them. And that's why we're, hot, we're fired up for evangelism and you know, thank God for Holly wanting to keep pushing, pushing me to get out there, pushing all of us to get out there, setting dates and things like that. Because we need to go and tell people. But you see, if we see ourselves as this tiny little being like a dwarf, 
and looking at these big giants of the devil. Because even when I was just sitting there looking, and I'm just thinking, gosh, this is not a nice place to be in right now. Even though I know that the Spirit of God is in the inside of me, the flesh wants to cr cry. It's just cringy. You just like feel the, the anger and the hatred, especially when you're dealing with some other religions, when you're preaching the name of Jesus. It just emanates from people. But yet we have got the eternal one living on the inside of us. We've got the glory, Christ in me, the hope of glory that should be pouring out. Where is the, the overflow going to come from? The overflow is going to come from they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. In fact, if there's a scripture verse for these last days, that is probably one major one. If we cannot learn how to hook up with the strength that he provides or the ability to rise above situations and circumstances that he provides, if we can't run like he needs us to run and not be weary, if we can't walk and carry the burden that we need to carry for somebody else. See, Jesus says his burden is light, but maybe sometimes you might have to pick up someone else's burden for them. So it might be a little bit heavy for a little bit. There's a power that comes when you wait upon the Lord. And there's a wisdom that is in, energized and imparted to you as you spend time in the Word, spend time in His presence, spend time praying in the Holy Ghost. We need to talk about praying in the Holy Ghost more in church. I know everyone in this building prays in the Holy Ghost, so it's not like a difficult one for me to preach here. You know, if you, if you really want to learn how to pray, get to a faith life location for 930. We pray. Every Sunday. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. There's a divine empowerment when you wait upon the Lord. Why does Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 7 says this? It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. It's the wisdom that is coming out of the waiting that is going to direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. He gives power to the faint. He increases strength to the weak. And as a result of waiting, you begin to have renewed strength. You have the ability to fly above life's problems. You've got increased speed to progress in life. You have energy and life power. You have a consistent ability to keep going. The pressure can never get too much if you are waiting in his presence. That word wait also means to bind together. There's an exchange happening when you're in his presence. There's a, an ability of God to pour out of his heart into your heart for you to pour out and let your problems. What does it say in the Bible? Cast all your care unto him. So you're exchanging your cares to him for his strength and ability to go through every situation and circumstance in life. There's a victory shout on the inside of you when you bind yourself to him. And when you tie yourself into his presence, tie yourself into his victory, tie yourself. Allow him to wrap his arms of love around you and never let you go. Don't run so fast that he's not there with you. Stay with him. Wait with him. Let him lift you up. He says he will exalt you in due time. You don't get weary of well-doing because in due season you will reap. And when we can do this as a church and as a global church, as a local church, as a national church, when we can do this with greater consistency, what happens? Faith and patience kicks into gear and the greater the flow of the Spirit that can be funneled through your life. See, our position in Christ is raised up in highly exalted spiritual place. It's far above all principalities. It allows us to stay in complete union with Him. There are no hindrances in the spirit to him talking to you. Only your mental resistance from someone not willing to faithfully step, faithfully step into the realm of the spirit. That's what holds you back. And I could read scripture after scripture here. But time is running short. But let me finish on 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 to 12. This is one of my favorite ones especially concerning when we're talking about wisdom. 
especially concerning understanding the ability that you have. But I, as it is written, I has not seen nor I heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God, there's that, those two words again, but God. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. See, you're raised up in heavenly places. You're exalted in him. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And there's something on the inside of you that's revealed to you by the, from the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. You have the Spirit which is of God that you might know the things that are freely given to us. Hallelujah. We are, not, we are not only capable of being bound with God as he lives in us, but it is a requirement. We daily by the Spirit can receive a great exchange to renew, strengthen, and lead our lives. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. And then you just go into James. Just, I've got so much to just pour out here. But the revelation of you sitting in heavenly places, James 1, 5 to 6, is this what? It says, if you lack wisdom, let you ask of God, that gives all to all men liberally and abrades not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. You know that wisdom in context is dealing with our most favorite Bible verses? Everyone loves these scripture verses. It's my faith, my, my, the one that I like to always quote, because you guys look at me like, help. My brother, encounter all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have a perfect word that you be perfect in entire wine, nothing, yay. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. What is the point of wisdom? The point of wisdom is to give you an ability to count it all joy so that when you do fall in diverse pressures and temptations, you know this, that the trying of your faith works patience, patient endurance, patient consistency. Let consistency have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. The wisdom opens the door for you to have the consistency so that you can have a place of perfect work so that you are perfect and entire wanting nothing. See, the wisdom of God is to get you to the place of complete prosperity, complete victory, complete health. Hallelujah. Complete victory. Have I preached you all to sleep? Hallelujah. I know there's not been many funny stories today. Canadian waffle. But when you count it all joy, it, that word count also means consider. Just count your blessings. When you count on your blessing, praise is on your lips. And then your speech is wrapped around the word of victory that brings endurance and strength. Hallelujah. Our patience, endurance has great recompense of reward. Cast not away, Hebrews 10, 35 to 36 is my last scripture verse. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patient endurance, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So when you understand where you sit, when you understand that you can ask for help, when you understand that you can praise him, count it all joy, and ask for wisdom in time of need, you understand that your victory comes from a place of being in his presence and waiting on him. Because then when you wait on him, your renewal and your strength and your victory comes clear. Hallelujah. Don't be double-minded. Because if you're double-minded, you're walking in the natural. And then you're walking in the spirit. And you're walking in the natural. It's like if you can't decide between steak and a dessert. You don't want to have a bit of dessert and then go back to the steak. It just isn't right. Have you ever tried ice cream and then steak? No, it's, it doesn't. It doesn't have. Don't be double-minded. There's an order of these things. Count it all joy. Count it all joy. Some of you need to hear this today. Some of you need to hear who you are again. 
there's a consistency in the word, and that is victory. God wins. You win. You succeed. Even if it all goes wrong and you die and you just go early, you still won. I mean, there, you know, we, we, sometimes people die early and we all try and analyze what did they do wrong, what great sin was in their life. It doesn't matter. They're in heaven. They'll never tell you. God will probably never tell you. God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to die on a cross for you. So whoever calls him Lord and whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Well, we give you all the glory today, Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your revelation and clarity. We thank you for the greatness of what you provided in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Help us have a revelation of this. I'm going to pray this over you again as we just close this prayer. Because I believe this church and anyone at the sound of my voice if we could get a hold of this, if we could get an understanding of this, hallelujah. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. Asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight, so that you may grow in your knowledge in God. I'm asking this of Faith Life Preston, that you constantly asking, that you ask God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight, so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that Faith Life Preston's hearts are flooded with light, so that you could understand the confident hope that he has given to those he's called. His holy people. You are his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Hallelujah. Well, we give you glory, Father. We thank you, Jesus, for what you did. And I thank you all for coming today. Thank you for enjoying his presence. I hope that you go out this morning and just go, this is the best Moses day ever. The word of God, revelation, support, joy, and victory. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father God. I just want to shout and dance, really. I know I'm keeping it quite calm today, but um, that's really where my heart is because the victory shout. Some of you, in, I, I believe this, you need to hear that I keep, having to say this, your victory is it on your lips. It's in your heart. You cannot approach this thing head on. You don't try and climb the mountain. Move the mountain. Too many of us are just, are just not waiting long enough in his presence to receive the renewal of strength that we need. And I, myself included, we need to stay in his presence. Live in the higher flow of his word. I, 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 I look at people like Robert and Holly, and they really do live there. I know their lives are probably not as perfect as I think they are. But I just sense that that joy in their lives, in their marriage, in their family. Christina, there's a flow that we can get into and live in and just enjoy his presence on a day-to-day -day basis. And just have that joy that is strong, strength on the inside of us. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We stand, me and Pastor Louise, stand with each and every one of you going through whatever you're going through. We're alongside you. We're lifting up your hands. We're praying for you. We're believing with you for wisdom, to know the hope of your calling. Sometimes we, we lose our hope in what he's called us to do. That word hope is expectancy. 
And if if you've lost your expectancy of what he is calling you to do, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And when your heart is sick, you make decisions that are wrong. You make decisions, your mind gets involved and you start being dictated by feelings. But your heart must remain pure. Your heart must be filled with joy and laughter. And you can cover that up with happiness and all sorts of stuff. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Those that wait upon the Lord shall see increased ability to succeed at the calling that they have been called into. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. People carry things. People carry the wrong things, but people also carry the right things. And when someone who's carrying the right thing turns up, you know there's a sense of the presence of God with them. I'm not going to name names, but there's people in this room that turn up and there's something that they bring with them and that's beautiful and wonderful. But if your hope, if your expectancy is lost and you're wandering around trying to figure out what God wants you to do, I'm telling you, stay in his presence. Wait on him. Be ready to hear his voice. Be re-energized as you spend time with him this week and in the weeks to come. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise you, Father. Well, I believe I've given what I'm supposed to give. I'll just finish off.